We also talk about margin of error with this. So there's hitting your target, and then there's kind of being around your target. And when we make a bike, generally, and I'm talking, I'm, I'm generally going to have an uh, off-road bias. That's my area of most expertise. I mean, I know st enough about road, but like for mountain, 99% of a ride is going to be in relatively benign conditions. You know, it's nothing too extreme for 99% of the ride. Maybe if you live some sick place like Whistler and you're on the chairlift, that might not be true. But for any sort of pedal trail environment, it's like you're just, you're cruising along. And then there's that sick drop. But if you think about it time-wise, the, all the time you spent hucking to flat is like 0.1% of your ride, right? So while it's nice to have a bike that's well-tuned for that area, it, it's, it's good to also think about the 99% of your ride. Also, within our geometry decisions, we can also make mistakes hard to make. Back in the day, riders like Sam Hill or Steve Pete rode 26-inch mountain bikes that I would never want to take down a hill in my life now. Knowing what I know now and what I'm used to now, I would never ride one of those horrific death machines that they were riding way faster than I could ever imagine on, right? Now, the margin of error for riding a bike like they were riding is very, very small compared to a modern downhill bike where the margin of error is much, much greater and there's a lot more tolerance for mistakes. Of course, they're going to push it even further because of that and start closing it down with faster speeds. But the thing is, it's like nowadays, especially in dirt, making a mistake is harder to do just from a geometric point of view, okay? And that's something we can really think about if we understand the geometry. This is a visual kind of look at it because, you know, I might refer to racers because racers are on the front page and all that stuff, they're easy to see. But these are, this is just a spider graph of optimization that you can think about when you're putting a bike together or building a bike or designing stuff in that, you know, there's several things, utility, traversing, climbing, aerodynamics, power, fun, descending, tricks, comfort. And like in this case one might be an XC racer where they're over here and they're trying to narrow down in these areas for optimizing in these conditions. And case two is a descending, they're over here. But it might be within your capacity making decisions that if you're not racing, if you don't have to worry about the title or getting points in that championship series, you could actually put together a bike that does this and covers a lot more space. You're a lot more comfortable. You have a lot more utility or fun on the bike versus trying to get that little bit extra on these sides for one little place. You could have a bike that's more fun, more places, more of the time. And that's a decision you have to make. Certainly people on the bleeding edge of racing, they're gonna look for more optimization all the time within one little area. And that, you know, that's fine. You just make those decisions. I'm just trying to show graphically that it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. And you can actually make a bigger area sometimes if you don't have to optimize just in one parameter. And this is, of course, the diminishing returns map, kind of where we get our 80-20 rule. Like if we look at our results up to 100 and our effort up to 100, if you're looking for 100% uh, results or, <coughs> excuse me, 100% effort over here on this blue chart, you know, to get up to 100% effort, well, you're gonna be putting in 100% effort, but look at this point of diminishing returns that we always talk about. To get that last, 30% over here, or we say 20% sometimes. And this is, this is just a theoretical graph. It, it's not a real thing. Anyway, but um, this, you can have an easier time getting into here than you can into here. And it might cost you a huge amount of money replacing every single part on your bike with carbon or titanium or you know, training every single day or eating from a blender or whatever you have to do to get to that point. It's so hard, but it's not too hard to get here. But I see a lot of people down here because they're not really thinking about it. How do I get rid of that other thing? Gee whiz. Okay, anyway, do folks get that concept? You know, and these are decisions that the tuner or the fitter or the, the you know, I say tuner, we don't have tuners in bicycling, but we should. Um, in motorsport, we have tuners. Like if I work, when I work in professional 
uh, motorcycle racing, you know, you have a tuner and that's, that's the person that you go to to help you make these decisions for where you're going to go because these are hard skills to learn how to tune and, and do all that stuff. Just reading magazines is definitely not going to do it.